My name is Stan Krivenso, and here is the title of my presentation today. It's my first Kaggle presentation. Uh, it's IEEE Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, which I used to be a member of, uh, Signal Processing Society Camera Model Identification Kaggle Competition. So basically, you're supposed to identify the model of the camera based on the photos that were made with this camera. And the competition ended about a month and a half ago. It had some decent prizes, 12,000, 8,000, 5,000, 582 teams. Yes? So some photos, they have camera identifying information embedded in the photo. Uh, did, did you try using I'll, that? I'll get to it in a couple of slides. Because okay. yeah. that'd be easy. <laughs> uh, yes, so uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm somewhat new to this group, maybe like two or three months. I have a PhD in power electronics from Penn State uh, and a master's in computer science from Tulane University. And then I spent about 10 years playing poker online for a living. And uh, now I'm tired of playing poker. So I've, I've been studying machine learning over the last like maybe six months. And I want to find a job in this field. And Kaggle for me is a way to uh, prove that uh, I'm competent because otherwise it's pretty hard to get a job if you don't have several years of experience. I have a question about your 10 years of poker, of <laughs> professional poker playing. Yes. What was that? Did you just get up in the morning and play poker every day? Like what uh, that Pretty like? much like that. Yeah, I played online. So basically I just wake up, go to the computer, play a little bit, like win or lose a thousand dollars or something, and then just go to other stuff. But then I got tired of it because I sometimes I just have really long sessions because I, I don't want to lose money and it's just not psychologically good for me. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so if you want, yeah. Uh, oh, I thought you had a question. Uh, if you want to know more about me, here's a link to my blog. Uh, and I guess I'll start with the competition. Uh, so this is the official problem statement for the competition to build an algorithm that identifies which camera model captured an image by using traces intrinsically left in the image and not image metadata. I guess that was, that's what the question was about. Uh, so yeah, there was, uh, I'm not sure if there actually was metadata in the training set. Uh, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't matter because there were labels anyway. So for the training set, you could tell which camera made the images. In the test set, there was definitely no metadata. And the evaluation metric was uh, weighted accuracy. So basically it's just accuracy, but they had uh, two types of samples there in the test set. Uh, some were unaltered and some were altered in some way. And I'll describe the ways in a couple of slides. And the weighted accuracy gave more weight to the unaltered images than to the altered ones. Yes? Uh, what traces the metadata? No, no, no metadata. Like the, Oh, you mean like what, what? There's a green light that comes on in the middle of this. The quick press at the bottom. Yeah, that's green. red. You need to push it once more. Okay. Okay. Could you repeat the question? Thanks. Yes. Uh, what are these traces that are left in the image? Are you talking about the way the pixels are organized? Yeah, sort of something like that. Yeah, like uh, because different cameras use different sensors, different lenses. So uh, basically those images are in some way different. And it was up to the competitors to find out exactly what, it, like, how to determine in what way they were different and uh, how to recognize if they belong to a certain camera. Yeah, it's just based on the pixels. Yeah. So the the different the, the different uh, um, uh, camera makers they they don't give you that information right away. You figured it out. Uh, well, I mean, there is no reason for the camera makers to give some specific information on the like pixel arrangements. Uh, uh, no, yeah, you have to figure it out, yes. Is this something that, that humans can do already? Uh, humans? Uh, I'm not sure about humans, I cannot. <laughs> uh, I believe so, yes. So even experts, like, they, they wouldn't really be able to tell which uh, Not right away. I mean, maybe uh, there are some ways how an expert could, like, uh, 
with like if they, if an expert had a lot of images from one camera and from another, maybe they would be able to find some differences between them. I don't know, but it's not something that is obvious. Uh, another question? Is the, look, uh, is there a um, even within a camera model? Is is there any intrinsic differences between between different cameras within a model? Okay, uh, there are probably some differences, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. Uh, basically, uh, the setup was that uh, one camera, one particular camera, was used for all of the training samples, and then uh, another camera of the same model, but a different actual camera, was used for the test samples. So there was some difference in this way between the training and the test set, but uh, the winner's accuracy was about like 99%. So obviously this difference was not large enough so that they weren't able to determine it with high accuracy. What model they reviewed to get into this challenge? Are you a photographer? Uh, no, I'm not a photographer. I was basically just choosing one of the challenges uh, that finished recently because uh, this particular group, it covers a lot of competitions. So most of the uh, older ones were already covered. And I looked at this one and it looked interesting because I, I'm actually interested in image processing and deep learning. And I thought this was a good competition for me to give a presentation on. I guess all of them were raw images, no fil no filtering, nothing like that, right? Uh, I'll say a couple of words about that. Uh, there were some changes to images. Yes, so uh, first I'll tell you a little bit about the motivation uh, for this challenge. Basically, they're saying that camera images are often used as, used as evidence, let's say in uh, criminal trials, for example. and. Uh, it's not a very reliable piece of evidence because it's easy to alter images by splicing together content from two different cameras. So maybe like the left side of the photo is from one camera and the right is from another. And uh, we cannot really determine whether it's the same camera based on metadata because it's very easy to change if you have the right software. Uh, so you need an algorithm that would, would be able to distinguish this kind of difference between cameras. Uh, so uh, here is a description of the training data set. Uh, so they used 10 popular camera models. Uh, nine of them were smartphone cameras, and uh, the other one was Sony NEX7, which I, I guess is like a mid-range in terms of price, like regular camera. And they had uh, 275 full high-resolution JPEG images from each device, a single device per model, uh, which amounted to about 10 gigabytes of total data. Uh, but uh, they allowed use of any kind of external training data, which made a huge difference for this competition because the winners, they got about maybe like uh, uh, 500 gigabytes of data additional to train on. So yeah, definitely in this kind, of, this kind of like most people in this competition use deep learning and in deep learning, the amount of data really matters. Uh, so the, can you describe what sort of external data they got so that they were able to like get external data, data that was specifically certain phones taking certain pictures? Or? Uh, so basically they looked for data everywhere online on like uh, different social platforms and such uh, because most images they have metadata and so they basically just read that metadata and identified the camera that made those images. and. So, I mean, for, for the vast majority of images online, there is no reason for people to change metadata. So, like, if it says that it was made with, like, uh, an iPhone 6, then it probably was made by, with iPhone 6. So, Yeah, and he, here are some of the actual images from that uh, training data set. So, basically, there could be anything there, I guess. Uh, the people who prepared it, 275 images is not that much, basically. If you have a camera, you can do it in like 10 minutes. So I guess that's how they did it, probably. Uh, and for the test data set, they used the same 10 models of devices used 
uh, that were used for the training set, but uh, they used a different actual physical device for each of the models. And uh, instead of using full resolution images, they cropped uh, pixel blocks 512 by 512 from the center. And the images presented for in the test data set were not JPEGs, were, they were in the T format, which is supposed to be like uncompressed and such. But actually half of the images were altered before they were put into this format. And here is a list of possible alterations. Uh, you could tell which were marked, uh, like uh, the altered images were marked, but they were not marked with, with the method. So you, you couldn't tell which of those methods were, was used for the alteration, but it was JPEG compression, resizing, or gamma correction, those three types. Yes? Um, did they give any indication why they made the test data set so different to the training data set? It seems like... Well, it's uh, not really that different. Like, what, what do you think is so different? So if but, it's in, not in JPEG, it's in TIFF? Uh, well, uh, I, I would say it's probably well. because so that, uh, uh, like, when people are actually making the predictions, they don't have to deal with the JPEG compression. Uh, they can just treat the pixels as a matrix. Uh, but I'm not sure, like, I, I don't think it was, like, a big deal in this competition. It's just, they, they, I think they just made it easier for the people. To, okay. Although, I don't know. I mean, I guess there are functions that treat JPEG as well, so. Mm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so basically when you have a problem like that, uh, you, you can like think about ways to do it. And one way would be to try to use some kind of domain knowledge to understand what makes those cameras different, like in what way are the sensors different there or the lenses or anything like that. Uh, I don't know if there are any people who actually tried doing that, but none of them ended up to be among the winners, if there were any. Uh, so basically right now, if you're dealing with the images, Pretty much everyone uses deep learning and convolutional neural networks. And here is a brief history of how it started. Basically, uh, a group of scientists at Stanford, uh, including Fei Fei Li, who is pretty famous right now, uh, started the ImageNet project in 2009, which is a large database of images uh, for visual object recognition. And they have this annual challenge where uh, different machine learning methods are supposed to distinguish among 1,000 categories from a data set of about, uh, it says about 500,000 images. It might change from year to year. and They might be making it bigger, I think. Uh, and uh, in 2011, when they didn't have con good convolutional neural networks, uh, a good classification error on this challenge was about 25%. <laughs> Uh, but then in 2012, a uh, convolutional neural network called AlexNet came along and uh, it achieved the 16% error rate, which was much better than uh, all of the other competitors. And since then, everybody started using convolutional neural networks. And in 2017, uh, the majority of competing teams, 29 out of 38, actually got less than 5% of the labels wrong. So right now, it's they're getting pretty much almost every image right, and actually the accuracy is exceeding human accuracy in some cases. I have one point. I have one point on this for the people that aren't aware of that competition. The accuracy is measured as a top five. So if they, if they're, they're allowed to get to five guesses, wait, is that how it works? Isn't it top three? Well, regardless, how does it work? They guess three images, and then if any of those three are the correct image, then they... Okay, for this particular challenge. For that, for that challenge. Okay, So yeah. 5%, yeah. It's yeah, that's good information, yes. Yeah, and this is... Ba this, okay. okay. And, <laughs> and this basically visualizes what I just said. Uh, as you can see, the error rates, they drop very significantly from year to year because the convolutional neural networks are getting better. Uh, so since... Pretty much every one of the winners in this competition used convolutional neural networks. I want to say a few words about those. And I'll start with neural networks in general. Uh, so when you have a neural network, uh, you have uh, some inputs here. 
and you have some outputs, and everything between the inputs and the outputs is uh, the hidden layers. And each, like in this kind of regular neural network, each subsequent layer is connected, like every, uh, every neuron in the hidden layer is connected to every input, and then in the next layer, every neuron is connected to every neuron in the previous layer, and so on. Uh, those are called like dense or fully connected layers. And uh, I'm not going to go into formulas too much in this presentation, but basically I just wanted to show like there is the forward pr propagation formula where you have uh, some matrix W, matrix of weights, uh, times uh, the previous set of inputs, uh, and then you apply the activation function to it to make it nonlinear, because otherwise if you just had uh, linear blocks, you could just combine them into one linear block and it would be just something like linear reg regression. Uh, yes, question? How did you strategize? Sorry, if you had to do a mic, because it's uh, going to be on video. What was your strategy? Like, uh, you know, you read uh, the, the rules. So, uh, you know, how did you divide the problem? Uh, and then how did you strategize? And, uh, and can you give us an idea of also of how much time were you putting into this? And, and also, um, uh, why did you choose this uh, um, uh, type of machine learning to tackle the problem? Oh. The, 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 okay, the problem? Uh, first of all, I did not participate in this competition. I'm just uh, making a presentation on it. So the only time that I spent was uh, researching the results of the competition and making the presentation. Uh, but in general, this is like most people who participated in this, they treated it as a standard machine learning problem. So basically, you have a training data set, and you have a test data set, and you just use the convolutional neural networks, uh, use them smartly to uh, train them on the training data set, and then predict on the test data set. Uh, so basically what I was saying here is that you have forward propagation, you have back propagation, and all of those here, mm -hmm. all of those Ws here are matrices. Sorry, could you? Yes. Did you come across anything that explained why everybody or most of the winning teams went for the convolutional neural network? Well, because... That's uh, not always going to be the case, is it? Uh, what's not always going to be the case? That should be the, th the type of um, model to build. Well, I don't know how it's going to be in the future, but right now, if you want to predict something on a lot of images, uh, convolutional neural networks usually give much better results than anything else. Okay. So specifically for images, this is it. Yeah, specifically for images, that's what all people use, yes. Uh, so basically what you need for neural networks is to, to, you need to perform a lot of matrix calculations. And those matrices can be pretty, matrices can be pretty big uh, if you have a lot of inputs and a lot of hidden layers. So what uh, most people use because it really speeds up the calculations is GPUs or graphics processing units. Uh, they're just computer video cards essentially, so a lot of people have GPUs, but not all of them are equally good. Uh, uh, there is a company named NVIDIA which makes really good GPUs and they, have this uh, program called CUDA. This is a piece of software that allows you to use those GPUs uh, to perform numerical computations. Uh, and GPUs are much faster than CPUs, especially when you have parallelized data, uh, because they're designed for processing parallel workloads efficiently. Because, I mean, a GPU is basically a graphics card. And like even like a very standard uh, monitor screen right now is like a million pixels or it could be like two million pixels. So they have to process those in a reasonable amount of time so that you don't see any uh, weird stuff on your screen, like any distortions or anything. So uh, that's what people use for neural networks. They use CUDA and NVIDIA GPUs. And uh, as you'll see, a lot of winning teams here, they use like a whole bunch of those GPUs, like five, 10 GPUs, where they ran the uh, model training. Uh, and using a specifically designed matrix computation libraries such as Torch, Theano, TensorFlow, and MXNet, even, you can train even large neural networks very efficiently nowadays, which might still take quite a bit of time 
okay, so what is a convolutional neural network? Uh, basically, convolutional neural networks, they're inspired by connectivity patterns between neurons and human and animal visual cortexes. Uh, the, way, the way it works, so like when you perceive an image, you don't just perceive it as a whole. Uh, there are certain uh, combinations of neurons in, in your brain that look at specific parts of the image. And there has been some research, I believe, like long time ago, even like in the 50s or 60s, that confirmed that. Uh, and then based on those parts, uh, other neurons in your brain decide what the whole image is. So uh, here is an illustration of, uh, of that. Like when most people look at this picture here, they see a smiling face, like a smiling child. But this is turned 180 degrees. If you look at the actual picture, that's what it looks like. <laughs> this is hardly a smile. But uh, what happens here <laughs> is uh, there is a bunch of neurons in your brain that is trained to uh, recognize smiles. So when you look at the part with the teeth and the lips, so that, that part tells that there is a smile there. And then uh, some other parts see the eyes and the face and everything. And then they combine it together. There is a smile, there is a face, so there is a smile and face. And convolutional neural networks uh, kind of work the same way. Uh, the convolutional neural units only process data within their respective uh, field of vision. And uh, then the outputs are processed together in the next layers to form a bigger picture. Uh, and here is uh, a picture of a relatively simple convolutional neural network. So basically, here you have uh, some, uh, there are different types of layers in a convolutional network. You have convolution layers where you kind of go with this narrow window, let's say five by five pixels over the whole image and uh, perform a convolution. A convolution is essentially just multiplying it by a matrix of weights, but you take each five by five uh, uh, window there and then you perform a convolution and you use uh, several different sets of weights which are called filters. And as a result, you, you get some depth in your convolution. So here, let's say like those three layers here, they are uh, your convolutional depth, the depth of your convolutional layer means that you, you're using three different filters here. And then sometimes you have some pooling layers where you just take uh, some areas here and combine them using either maximum like max pooling or average average pooling into uh, just one value like one pixel. So it Helps, helps you to keep, keep everything under control because otherwise if you don't have those pooling layers then you might end up with uh, uh, too much data there. And then you, here you have another convolutional layer and another pooling layer and then usually at the end of the, neural, uh, of the convolutional neural network you have a couple of one or two or several fully connected layers. And then you apply softmax to give you a prediction here. Let's say it predicts a boat with 94% uh, probability. Uh, and uh, the thing about convolutional neural networks is that typically very little image pre-processing is required. So basically right now people really believe that if you just give the convolutional network the data, it will figure it out by itself. So you don't really need to pre-process the image in any way. And uh, here I also wanted to mention some uh, modern uh, convolutional neural network architectures, uh, which uh, most of the winners used in some form. Uh, not the first couple of them. Uh, I just, I'm just mentioning them for historical reasons. The LeNet in 1990 was, was one of the first successful convolutional neural networks. But at that time, there were no fast computers. So uh, no one really used it for anything significant. And then the AlexNet was the one that actually made a difference for this uh, image net recognition challenge. And uh, then in uh, 2014, there were two important ones, the VGG net, which showed that if you make the network deeper, you can really uh, uh, increase your accuracy for prediction. And also the Google net 
or it's also called Inception v1 because it uh, introduced the first version of the so-called Google Inception module. It uh, really reduced the number of parameters by using this Inception module, which uh, stacks one by one, three by three, and five by five convolutions within the same module of the network. Uh, I don't think I'm going to discuss this in detail, uh, but uh, I, I have a picture of that uh, Inception module at the end of the presentation, so if, in case if we have time, we could take a look at it. And then uh, one of the very popular modern convolutional neural network architectures is the ResNet, uh, which is uh, very deep. Uh, it could have like 50 to 200 layers, but could, could even have up to 1,000 layers. Uh, and uh, it, ha it has this special structure w where inputs to later layers can be sums of outputs from previous layers. So it, it, let's say it does the convolution, but then it also connects the original inputs to, to that output. So uh, apparently this is very efficient for what convolutional networks do for like image recognition and tasks like that. And another model is DenseNet, which has each layer connected to every other layer in a feed-forward fashion. So it's like sort of fully connected, but it also has all of those convolutions in it. So uh, a lot of winners also use this one. And another one that, another two that the winners used is Exception, which replaced the standard Inception modules with uh, depth-wise separable convolutions. I'm not going to explain what that is. And uh, dual path network, which combines the ResNet and DenseNet uh, architectures in one network. So yeah, hopefully this was not too boring. I sort of wanted to include this because uh, most winners used one of those configurations. So I just wanted to sort of know the words, but uh, okay. So here I wanted to show you like a typical deep learning setup. So basically you have your GPU here and then you control that uh, using CUDA that I mentioned. And then also there is a, a sort of library. It's also a low level one, but it's a little bit higher level than CUDA. It's called QDNN, specifically for deep neural networks, because CUDA basically enables you to do any kind of calculations and QDNN is for neural networks specifically. And then uh, you have a lot of uh, numerical libraries that allow you to like th that you can program directly such as, such as Torch or Tiano or TensorFlow or MXNet or there, there are many others like there's one from Microsoft uh, uh, CNTK I think and there are others that you could use for that so you this is high enough level so that you can program them directly but a lot of people also use something like Keras which is even higher level and where you can uh, write much simpler procedures to con control all of those lower, lower level ones. So that's sort of how, like most people just, uh, most winners in this competition, they just used something like written for either Keras or I think uh, the first place winners actually used Torch. Uh, they probably still would have used Keras, but Torch doesn't have a Keras interface. so. And uh, I don't know. Well, actually, they mentioned there that Torch, in their opinion, is faster than Keras. So, I mean, maybe they wouldn't have used it. Okay, so uh, here is a list of key techniques used by winners. Uh, one that I have already mentioned is getting lots of high-quality external data. Uh, like the, the first and the second place, they each downloaded something like 300 or 500 uh, gigabytes of external data. And uh, some of them, I think, ended up not using all of it because it was just too much. But uh, still, whatever they used definitely helped. Uh, then the second uh, is the effective training design, like state-of-the-art convolutional neural networks. And one that I will discuss in a little bit more detail in the, in the few following slides is the Atom Optimizer. Uh, this is uh, how you uh, do the stochastic uh, gradient descent to train your neural networks. Uh, then another key factor was uh, using strong GPU hardware, 
uh, I also mentioned this one because uh, with, when you have more GPUs, you can train bigger networks, you can train them on more uh, data, so you usually end up with better accuracy. Yes? Um, so in this competition, um, um, how much of the fact that the winners won was based on their like hardware? Like, was it like, uh, very much like hardware limiting or did they? I would say it was very important. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so basically if you didn't have a lot of good hardware, uh, I think like that's uh, that may be one of the reasons why the team that finished in third place didn't win it and finished in third because uh, their software, uh, their hardware was not nearly as strong as the first two teams. Yes. So my question question was similar basically to that. Did it feel like while you were going through the posts and uh, 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 people's opinion on uh, what's going on in there that it was more like a race of the uh, who has more resources? Uh, sort of, yeah, to some extent, definitely. And uh, so, I, mean, I wonder, like, the, the, um, the, the price tag, it wasn't too high, so basically whoever had used those resources, was it even worth it <laughs> in, in terms of, like, money? I mean, many people get their resources for free, like, in universities and stuff, but, like, honestly, like, this is, like, an arm race. Uh, well, sort of, yeah. I mean, like, uh, basically most of the teams that uh, did really well in this competition were from Russia, uh, where they have a lot of GPUs mining Bitcoin. Uh, so, <laughs> Did you notice what was the difference in terms of performance between the teams only using the sample test data, uh, training data versus the ones? What was the difference in their accuracy? Did you notice that? Uh, I'm not sure. Like, none of the top teams just used the, the training set. Like, all of them downloaded more data. Uh, it's, I mean, it's also, it also depends on their GPU setup because, like, if you only have, let's say, one GPU, even if you download a lot more data, you might not be able to use it because you won't have enough time to train your network on that data. Although what uh, the first place team did was uh, very smart, and I, I think that was part of the reason why they succeeded, and I'll talk more about that. But basically, they used some limited amount of data for actually training the first stage of their uh, model, and then they used the rest of the data for blending, and I'll talk more about blending. So do you know when uh, the first like winners, they actually started that training? Because... I think in last advanced reading, uh, we discussed that Google ran like for six months, I think, the training yeah. process, right? So basically, whoever starts first has more hardware, it's like... Well, <laughs> well, the competition is uh, announced at the same time for everyone. I think like the whole competition time frame was like maybe three or four months, something like that. I'm not sure exactly, but uh, here, the thing is... Did anybody mention the time that they spent on training? Uh, not like specifically, but basically uh, every team like uh, that achieved a high result, I think they spend the entire period of the competition on like uh, enhancing their models and training. Uh, but the thing is, I mean, you have to remember that this is not ImageNet. You don't have like 500,000 images uh, where you have to recognize a thousand categories. It's a much smaller problem, so you don't have to train it for six months. But you have much more data because basically, as, as you mentioned, uh, it's basically every image or like most of the images on the internet is labeled data for exactly that because they do have metadata and you can use for camera, right? So you just run a Google search, grab all of these images, uh, put them through the network, and you've got your data, uh, right? So yes, it's possible it's that more the than teams could get. So, it's so. possible that the teams could get more data, but I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure no no team in the competition, at least among the winning teams, got anywhere close to the size of ImageNet. I mean, uh, so I I mean, like uh, the training data in the actual training set was about 10 gigabytes, so. And it was about uh, 2,000 images. 
And the biggest number that I saw was 500. So it's, uh, it's about like 100,000 images or something like that, maybe 150,000. And they ended up, by, I think, not using all of it. So yeah, I mean, like basically you, you don't have, like even if you have lots of data, you don't have to use it all. Basically, you just use whatever uh, is uh, appropriate for your resources. OK, so uh, another important factor here is good validation. Basically, I'll talk more about leaderboards later, but uh, there is the public leaderboard, uh, w which you get uh, during the competition before the results are announced. And uh, in the public leaderboard, uh, you, you, if you run a lot of, uh, like if you, if you keep changing your model, some of those will produce uh, better results due to overfitting. And, but they will not necessarily be better models. They will not necessarily generalize better to the actual set that uh, you'll be judged on. Uh, so you have to be careful uh, to not overfit to the part of the test set that is used for the public leaderboard. Uh, and for that, you need to have a validation set. So basically, you have a set of images that are labeled, but you are not using for training. And then you can run your model on those images and, and see uh, how it performs. And you need to do it in a smart way so that, because if you use that validation set too many times, then you'll also be overfitting to that validation set. Uh, then uh, other methods that uh, the winners used uh, were ensembling and blending or stacking. So basically, the idea is, and I will discuss it in more de details in the slides, is that when you use several different models and then combine the results of those models in a smart way, then you get better performance than if you just have one model. <coughs> uh, another one uh, that I will uh, also discuss is pseudo-labeling. Uh, I guess I'll discuss it when I get to it. And also test time augmentation, so changing your uh, images in the test set uh, performing certain transformations with those images to get better predictions. And I'll also discuss that. So I'll go over some of those techniques in more detail. So uh, in order to talk a little bit about Adam, uh, I'll just start with general gradient descent algorithms. Uh, I guess you're all somewhat familiar with those. So if you want to find a local minimum, you just calculate the derivative or the gradient or the Jacobian matrix, which are all essentially the same thing uh, at the point where you're at. And then you move in the direction opposite to that. So if you want to optimize the weights here, for example, you uh, create an update to those weights, which is opposite to the derivative here and you have your learning rate alpha, and you keep doing it and doing it and doing it until the derivative gets to zero, in which case you have found uh, some sort of a minimum. It might be not be a global minimum, it might be a local minimum, but uh, if, if, if this local minimum is deep enough, then there is nothing you can do. But there are methods where if, if it's like a shallow local minimum, there are methods which I will talk about in the next couple of slides that uh, can help with that. Uh, there is the standard gradient descent, which is batch gradient descent, where you calculate uh, those derivatives on the entire training set. Uh, for small alpha, this is guaranteed to converge to a local minimum. The problem is, uh, for many uh, problems, you have like thousands or even tens of hundreds of thousands of uh, your input examples. So if you calculate on, like on every step, you calculate the derivative on all of those, uh, then it will be really, really slow. So what pretty much everyone is using uh, in training convolutional neural networks is stochastic gradient descent, where you calculate this derivative on just one randomly chosen example for each step. And you make small steps, and you choose your example, like a new example on each step. Or maybe a mini batch gradient descent where you calculate it in a small random subset of uh, training examples and you change that on every step. Uh, so this is all pretty standard. And you also have a thing that is called momentum. 
basically the idea is, especially for stochastic gradient descent, where you can collage on just one example, uh, your derivative can change very significantly from one step to the other. So basically, like, let's say if, if you want to go from here to there, uh, what, like, batch gradient descent does, you sort of just go towards the direction of your gradient. But when you calculate the stochastic gradient descent, you uh, calculate it based on one example, and it might just fluctuate randomly. So you do this, and then you do this, and then sort of just wander around. Uh, so to help that, uh, there is this idea of momentum, which uh, for each weight update, it has two terms. One is some parameter gamma uh, times the previous weight update, and the second is uh, your learning rate alpha times the derivative. And uh, this so sort of helps uh, the gradient descent to move in the right direction. Like if it starts moving in, in one direction, it just keeps moving in that direction. So that's momentum. And here is a picture where you can see with no momentum, it just oscillates kind of, it, it eventually gets there. But with momentum, it, it learns that it's supposed to go in, the, in that direction. Like uh, and every step, it, it moves towards the right there in the picture. So, so it gets there faster. And uh, there is also something called uh, Nestor of uh, stochastic gradient descent, which is same as momentum, but it, it tries to look ahead and calculate the derivative at the step uh, where if you, if you made gamma times the previous, like if you made sort of like the previous step again, and you, you look what the derivative is there, and then you, uh, you, put, you put that into your formula here. And there are also many uh, methods that uh, work on the learning rate alpha uh, because it's important to manage it in a smart way, especially when you have some parameters that are sparse, then they won't be contributing as much to uh, your gradient descent as those parameters that are not sparse. Uh, sparse means that uh, a lot of, there are a lot of zeros in those parameters. So basically, there are a lot of methods uh, which mostly tend to start with ADA for like adaptive uh, gradient descent. Uh, they use uh, different values of learning rate for different parameters, choosing larger values for the sparse ones. And basically, uh, ADAM seems to be the best choice of stochastic gradient descent algorithm right now for most uh, problems that you might encounter. Uh, so if you don't really, if you're not an expert in this field and you want to solve a problem like that, probably just use Adam. Because, and most winners in this competition use this. Okay. Uh, this was a little bit mathematical, I, but I wanted to mention that. Uh, here is something that I think will be a lot easier to understand uh, than sampling. Uh, this is a popular technique where uh, you use uh, several uh, machine learning models and then you combine them to improve the accuracy of each model. And in many cases, it leads to a several percent increase in the accuracy of predictions. And uh, like before I started preparing for this presentation, I sort of understood that this works, but I didn't realize why. I thought it was just some kind of like wishing and hoping, uh, like two heads are better than one and stuff like that. But actually there's a mathematical reason, uh, which is explained here on a very simple example. Let's say you have three independent classifiers, each is 70% accurate, and you decide to, to use all of them and then combine the predictions by using the majority rule meaning that if three or two of them agree, then you make that prediction. Uh, so if you calculate 70% times 70% times 70% in 34.3% of the cases, all three uh, will choose the correct one. And in 70% uh, times 70% times 30% times three, if you just calculate the probabilities, 44.1% will choose two of them correct. Uh, two of them will choose the correct one. So uh, if you calculate the ensemble accuracy, if you use the uh, majority rule, then you'll have 34.3% plus 44.1. So you actually increase your accuracy by 8%. Uh, 
uh, even though you're using the same classifiers, each of them has only 70% accuracy, and now you get 78% accuracy. Uh, a very important caveat here is that uh, they really have to be independent in their predictions, because if you have, if let's say two of them give the same prediction, then obviously they'll always be in the majority. So your prediction will always have the accuracy of 70%, regardless of what the third one is doing. Yes. Um, how would you ensure that they were independent? Is that even possible? Well, I mean? uh, in reality, they will never be fully independent, but you want to make them somewhat independent. And what you do in actual machine learning for that, you're trying to choose your models that you are averaging, that you are ensembling, uh, to be as different as possible from each other. So let's say if you have like uh, neural networks and decision trees, those are pretty different algorithms in, in their nature. So there is a better chance that they will be independent from each other. If they're too similar, are you going to like run the risk of being like, now I'm super confident in this thing that I actually shouldn't be that confident in? Well, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by confident, but uh, basically you... You ensemble them, and then you look at the accuracy on the validation set. So if you get better accuracy, then you're good. If you don't get better accuracy, then probably there is no need to ensemble those. Uh, you might think about what the reasons are. But uh, And here I give a few more examples. Let's say they don't all have to have the same prediction accuracy. Let, let's say you combine 90%, 80%, and 80%, and you actually get 92%, even though two of them are 80%. But you actually get an addition to 90%, even though you're using some that are not as good as the 90% one. And even if you use something like 90%, 90%, and 55%, you actually get higher than 90% as a result of that. Once again, this assumes that they're all independent. Uh, but the, the last example there shows that you don't always uh, get better accuracy. Let's say if you get 90, 70, and 70%, you only get 86.8. .8, so you'd, you'd be better off just using the 90% and not ensembling in this case. So, so the way you do it, you actually create your ensemble and you uh, run it on, a, on your set. And I mean, you, you predict it on your validation set and you see if your accuracy is better or worse. <laughs> And uh, when you have a lot of models, as it says here, you can use Pearson's co correlation coefficients to choose which ones are most uncorrelated for ensembling. Because if you have, let's say, 50 models, it could be pretty hard for you to choose which ones are the least correlated with each other. And you can't try all possible uh, combinations. So, so you can choose, let's say, the five, five using those statistical methods to see which ones are most uncorrelated and, and try ensembling those. Yeah, uh, another method that uh, the winners used uh, uh, is stacking and blending, which are pretty similar methods to each other. Basically, they both imply a two-step approach to classification. Uh, one, uh, in the first step, you train a first layer of classifiers and use their outputs to train a second layer of classifiers. And normally, you don't want to do it on the same set. So, so you, you make some predictions, usually in the form of softmax probabilities. And then uh, based on that, if you, if you just predicted based on that on the same set, uh, th this probably wouldn't give you a lot of new information. Uh, but if you train it on one set, and then you, you make predictions on another set, and then you use a second, second layer of models to train on that, this also has to be labeled. But if you train on that, then actually, the, I mean, it's not mathematically obvious that this will give you better results. But this, in a way, this is similar to ensembling. You're using several different models to, for the first and the second step. Usually, you don't want to use the same kind of neural network that you use for this first step to, for the second step here. But you definitely benefit from using different types of models here. And uh, the difference between stacking and blending is that for stacking, you choose cross-validation sets and, st and train on that for the second stage. And for blending, you have a separate holdout set that you don't use for the first stage at all, and you just uh, make predictions on that. And then you, you train this, uh, your second stage. Yes, Ken? Hello? 
Okay. Yeah. Um, so you mean in starting uh, the first layer, uh, the second layer is a subset of the first layer. Is that is that what you mean? And then for stacking, basically, you can do cross validation. So you can separate, uh, like, divide your set into like n subsets, and you train your models on n minus one and predict on the nth, and then you choose another cross another one of those subsets and train on the remainder and uh, predict on that and such. So let's say you divide it into five subsets. Do you understand? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Okay. A couple more techniques here, and then I'll be done, and I'll actually go to the solutions. Uh, uh, yeah, the pseudo labeling. It's. Uh, what, what you do, it's, it's actually sort of weird, but you train your model on the training set, then you run it on the test set and make predictions, and then you combine the training and the test set using your labels that you got as a result of your prediction as, the actual, as if they were the actual labels. This way you get a bigger set and you can train on that. Uh, and there is no overfitting in this case because you, you don't know the actual labels for the test set. You are just working with this, these pseudo labels that you got from predicting on the test set. I mean, it's not obvious to me at all why this should work mathematically, but apparently it improves your accuracy. So you use your test set to train on it using those labels that you got from uh, uh, training the model on the training set. Yes? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, the pseudo labeling, the way you describe it uh, at the bottom there, um, th this is something that'd be useful in the competition because you don't know what the test set labels actually are. Uh, well, but, but that's what I'm saying. You don't need to know. That's where you, you, you come up with the pseudo labels. Yeah, you come up right. with the pseudo labels. Yeah. In practice, though, is that actually useful? Uh, uh, well, as long as you don't really know what, you, like, if you have a if you have a set, yeah, this is like semi-supervised learning. Let's say you have a set where you know what the labels are. You, you've labeled a certain number of examples, right? But let's say you don't have the manpower to label a lot more. So what you can do, you can take a set that that is unlabeled. You can it might actually be bigger than your initial set. Sure. Okay. And then you can assign those pseudo labels and you can train on that and you're supposed to get better accuracy, yes. So do you know is, if anybody actually used that? Because this is useful when you have like a small data set. That's why people do that in general. In this case, again, the, to come up with data was just well, basic uh, Google search, right? So why would anybody use that if you have like real data? Well, the the like... I, I guess like, uh, well, as it says there, it helps the model to better learn the structure of data in the test set, uh, which is uh, the sentiment that some of the participants expressed. And actually, like, let's say even the first place team that won, it used pseudo labeling. So, so apparently maybe, there is some benefit okay, to using that. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I read the papers concerning the pseudo labeling. It's like a regularizer too. It's does regularization and prevents overfitting if it works in your case. So there's um, um, uh, some literature around it as a regularizer. Yeah, yeah, maybe it could be used as a regularization technique as well, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, the last technique that I'll talk about is the test time augmentation. So basically, deep neural networks need large amounts of training data for good performance. And data augmentation creates new training samples by applying certain procedures to the original data, such as random rotation shifts, flips, and such. So let's say if you have images of cats, it doesn't really matter to you if the cat is in the left corner or the right corner and which angle it has. So you can create more images for training by just uh, moving things around in your images. Uh, test time augmentation, you, you use the same technique on the test data, and then you predict on all of those different uh, shifted images, and then you choose the average, some kind of average of those results for your overall prediction. And uh, there is a good chance that if uh, 
uh, the model didn't recognize it in one form, it will recognize it in other forms, like uh, shifted, flipped, or whatever. And this way you can actually get better accuracy by using this technique as well. Yes? Uh, sort of a hypothetical question, um, but say you were doing something on, like, on the MNIST uh, set, and during, and during the test time you use this method and you use like flips, would that actually like help in that particular case? Like, uh, if you, you have, you know, like fives and twos or something, right? Anything well, like uh, I mean, uh, I don't know how, like on the Amnis set, you already get like 100% accuracy or something like that. So I'm not right, sure if yeah, you need more just... help with that, but... Uh, on like on most more complicated sets, uh, it looks like uh, you and it, it. This is actually pretty logical. Like pseudo labeling, it's not obvious to me when I look at it that it should work. It just looks like it works. Uh, but with this, like it, it's logical that if you move it around, there is some position where it will actually find what it's looking for. I, I do have a comment on that because that's something I've thought about when I was learning this stuff too. You have to make sure that the target that you're going for is invariant to whatever augmentation you're doing to it. So if you are flipping it and you're trying to predict a two and you flip it and now it looks like a five, it's not going to help you. It's going to make it a lot worse. So. But if it's like uh, this, this would definitely be invariant or like cats and dogs wouldn't matter. Maybe you wouldn't want to flip it horizontally, but I don't know, cats... A lot of cat photos, probably that'd be fine yeah. as well. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay. yeah. with numbers, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, if you flip it, it might result in a different number. Uh, so here I'm talking a bit about like Kaggle leaderboards. So there is the public and the private leaderboard. The private is the one uh, that you get at the end of the competition uh, and which determines your actual standing in the competition. And here, uh, this is the public leaderboard. As you can see, there are several results that are over 0.99. Uh, but then when you go to the private leaderboard, uh, there isn't a single result over 0 0.99. So there was definitely some overfitting going on there. And uh, the the guy who won the public leaderboard only, well, the team that won the public leaderboard actually only finished third in the private leaderboard there. Uh, so here is the first place solution. Uh, <coughs> They use 300 gigabytes of external data, use 20,000 photos for training, and then they used another 50,000 for blending because they didn't have enough time to train on all of that data. So this was a pretty good trick that definitely helped them. Uh, they used full-size crop, uh, the same size as uh, like the test data, plus TTA8, uh, test time augmentation 8. Uh, it's like some standard combination of flips and rotations, and then they used an ensemble of different CNN implementations, ResNet, DenseNet, uh, and some others uh, that I mentioned there. So basically all of those state-of-the-art modern uh, convolutional neural networks. And then for blending, they used something completely different from neural networks, which, uh, as I said, like when you use different models, it helps enhance your accuracy. So for blending, they used uh, XGBoost plus LightGBM, Plus, I'm not sure what they mean by Keras here, but some other technique from Keras, I guess. Uh, uh, and they used five NVIDIA 1080 Ti, which is one of the best GPUs. And they used another 1070. Is it good for Bitcoin mining? Uh, yeah. Yeah, the way you know that those teams are from Russia is that uh, ODS.ai in the name of those teams. I, I was actually, I actually got curious what it was, so I Googled it, and it's like a Russian uh, Slack channel. Yeah, I actually joined that Russian Slack channel to see what it's like, and uh, it's like a data science community in Russia because I'm from Russia originally, so I can read what they say there. Uh, yeah, and there is a lot of like information exchange there, and it's all pretty interesting. And the second place solution also from Russia called GPU muscles. <laughs> yeah, so, so they had uh, more than 500 gigabyte of external data trained on about 75,000 images, used 1,000 for validation. And uh, they had, uh, for some reason, they used 480 sized inputs instead of 512. 
and TTA 10, five crop, crops plus a flip, TTA 40 for some models where they added all possible 90 degree rotations. So they actually did more training like in terms of all possible things here. And they used 10 different convolutional neural network models for dense nets, for S nets, and two uh, dual path networks. And they had uh, 27 model checkpoints then averaged by geometric mean. I don't know why geometric and not like arithmetic mean, but I guess that was part of their model. And they used 13 NVIDIA GPUs, 9, Ti. So I guess this was probably like the most powerful setup that they had in the whole competition, at least among the winners for sure. Uh, and then the third plus place solution was uh, the one that was first on public leaderboard. Uh, it used uh, much less external data than the top two winners. And uh, they used similar techniques, five CNNs, and uh, different input sizes of images for random 90 degree rotations. And they used just a single GPU, NVIDIA Tesla P100 with 16 gig gigabytes of RAM. Uh, so yeah, they didn't have as much power as the first two. And here is the most interesting one, the 30th place solution. Uh, basically, he released his code at some point during the competition, and everyone realized that it was really good code. So both the first and place, second place team solutions were based on that code. So they just used that code for training. And he first posted that code without any restrictions, and then he said, uh, w wait a minute, guys. You can only use it if, uh, if you're a solo participant, if you're not part of a team. But it was too late because several teams already copied that code and, and they use it. So there is a bit of a controversy here because uh, those teams, they claim, at least they claim that they forked the code before the clause was added. So, so this guy actually, maybe he would have done better if he like, had a better GPU and never shared his code. So this was like an interesting thing about this competition. So here are some general Kaggle strategy ideas. Uh, if you want to succeed in Kaggle competitions, tend to choose competitions based on your available resources. So like if you don't have a GPU, you probably don't want to enter something like this. And uh, however, even with limited resources, you can actually achieve a high score as let, let's say the third place team shows they only had one GPU and actually they did pretty well. And uh, you definitely don't need don't want to optimize to the public leaderboard. You actually want to have a good validation set. And yeah, don't share your code if you, if you want to win, and <laughs> which kind of makes sense. Uh, here I have some really useful links for further study if you're interested in those questions. That I, like I, I only briefly, like I didn't have more time to go over the details of those like gradient descent mechanisms and ensembling and convolutional neural networks. But there are some really good links on the web uh, where you can get a lot more information. I particularly like those because none of them had used like really mathematical language. So yeah, if you look at those, I think you'll be able to understand everything they say there if you just spend some effort. Okay, uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you, do you have any questions? And I'm sorry if it was a little bit complex in terms of all those different methods. Yes. Um, are you going to be posting your slides uh, later on for people to? Uh, I have already posted them uh, on Meetup. If you go into the comments there, then they're on Google Drive. It, it, I, I'm not sure if this is the latest version. I might have added like uh, another link or two to those useful links. This, this is also live stream, so it's on YouTube. <laughs> yep. Just based off the solutions, it seems like it was more of a competition on GPU power. Uh, yeah, sources. to some extent, definitely, yes. Always. Yeah. <laughs> And, the, and external data. Yeah. More external data, more GPU power. Uh, just in case anyone feels too bad for the 30th place uh, com competitor, uh, Kaggle fairly recently has added the concept of rewarding people who do contribute to, uh, well, first of all, to, uh, did they do it for the discussions? They certainly do it for the, the kernel. So if you publish code, 
and people like it and they upvote you and everything. You actually get like cash prizes as the competition is going on. I think every week they, they award something. So uh, one of the great things about Kaggle is, is the way people do share uh, code. In this case, this guy may have yeah, felt a little bad that he just didn't have the hardware to sort of finish it off, but uh, hopefully he got some, some reward out of the experience anyway. Yes? Um, I'm really curious, at the very start, you introduced the idea of, like, that if you altered images, you could end up with, like, kind of half from one camera and half from another. Did anyone discuss that or, like, applications for that, that sort of thing? Uh, like, what do you mean? Like, that would definitely mess up your... Uh, yeah, well, there were no images like that in the training or test set. So I guess if you have a well-trained model, what you could do like to test for something like that is just to uh, take different chunks of images like from one side, from another side, and just see if you get the, the same prediction. Especially if you, since you get 99% here, I think you can be pretty confident in your predictions. Yes. So the training set was in high resolution JPEG, and the test set was in low resolution TIF. Uh, no, I think the resolution was the same. It's just for the test set they cropped the central uh, parts of those images. Did anybody crop the training set so that it was the same as the test set? Uh, yeah, I think that's what they mostly did in their solutions. Yeah, I mean they didn't train on the whole images. Like, if you look here, like. Uh, yeah, like let's say the first place solution, they use the full size crop for their training. So they, they basically crop the same size images that the test images like from the center. Yeah, because uh, it doesn't make sense to train your model on really big like 4,000 by 4,000 images or something like that if what you're going to be predicting is 512 by 512. So. So if you were to take part in a competition like this, what would you look at first? Uh, what would I do first? Yeah. Uh, get a lot of GPUs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, what would I, but I mean, what would I look at first is, uh, I mean, at first, like, I, the way I think I would, I would try probably to, uh, see if I could use some sort of domain knowledge. I mean, I don't really like the solutions that just uh, basically throw everything into like a convolutional network. So I would try to come up with at least some way of doing something logically, but uh, if this doesn't work out, then maybe, I mean, I mean, when I just first looked at this competition and I actually had this idea, what would I do? And actually I thought like maybe like when you make those images, what, what really matters is the distance from the center and not so much uh, in, w in which direction. So I was thinking maybe I could use something like circular convolutions. So like to fit the convolutional neural networks with like depending on the distance, like those radial slices there. So maybe I would try something like that because uh, this would at least be something different and maybe it would result in a better result, maybe not. but. But I think like my philosophy is that you want to do something different from other competitors if you want to win. I mean, unless you have like 20 GPUs or something. Uh, yes, can. Okay, uh, is this a research competition? You like have uh, IEEE stuff. Do they have to submit a paper to a workshop at the end of this? Uh, I think there was something about the workshop there, or like some. Oh, okay. uh, but I'm I'm honestly not sure. Okay. Okay, great. That was awesome. Let's give another round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, great job.